Good morning folks, welcome along to the vlog. You may have noticed on the way in that uh, the limp is almost not there. That's because uh, after yesterday's visit to the quacks, um, I was prescribed some naproxen and this is only day two of taking the medication. It seems to be kicking the Basatis's butthole. I thought somebody would come in then. So yeah, it looks good, it looks promising for this weekend at the very least. So maybe we'll be able to get some stuff done next week. It feels a lot better. I've got more movement in the knee. So yes, that's a good sign. Anyway, what did I say about uh, slowing down on projects? I know. I make myself out to be a liar sometimes, don't I? Because this package here is from the Soap Kitchen, a company in the UK who provide soaps. <laughs> And ingredients for making soaps and uh, although I've done I've not done a video yet for this guys I must admit that I have now made around uh, five batches of soap and I'm really enjoying the process and uh, I'm thinking about selling some of it particularly just on the bar in the pub little sideline um, and the good thing about soap is the longer you leave it the better it gets which is different to beer of course the longer you leave it the worse it gets because it has a finite shelf life so if I can start making some of this wonderful stuff uh, as another little hobby I know you might think I've got enough hobbies but if I'm enjoying it that's what life's about, isn't it, folks? That's what life's all about. So, uh, I think I'm gonna do probably more soap making, or definitely start to feature it on the channel. So stick around if you're into that. If not, just don't watch the videos that have got soap in the title, I guess. So, a um, few things that we've got here. Caustic potash, which uh, is potassium hydroxide. This is what's used in liquid soap, so I'm thinking about making our own liquid soap for the dispensers in the toilets of the pub. Might not be worth it, but uh, I want to do it. I want to try it at the very least. Uh, this is cowling clay. This stuff is, uh, is almost like um, something to make the soap glide across your skin. It's, it gives the soap a luxurious feel but it is basically just like a, a powder, a clay powder. So I thought I'd give that a whirl. A kilogram was only like three quid or four quid, so it's worth just grabbing some. And then in these vessels, we have uh, some sweet almond oil and some refined castor oil. So the different types of oils that you put into the soap provide different qualities. Like uh, castor oil is used to enhance the bubbling capacity, the lava capability of the soap, and so on. Uh, let's have a look what we've got here. We have a hey, secret package. What's in the mystery package? Let's have a look. Okay, these are colours. So I'm wanting to experiment a little bit by putting some fantastic vibrant colours in the soap and the best way I, you can do it I'm told is by the mica clays so here we have like a, a, a sample pack if you will of microfine glitters to put into the soap Abigail will really enjoy this by the way that's another reason why I'm doing it the kids love mucking about with this kind of stuff that was some black oxide that I got, so uh, we can put blacks into some of the soaps. Maybe the more masculine star soaps. And then here we have the mica powders. So you put these in a little bit of oil and use them to colour the soaps. Obviously we'll go into more detail with that as we uh, make a soap making video. And then here we have um, blue flowers. So 
obviously they're not all blue but that's what they're sold as so we've got calendula cornflowers blue marvia uh, ivory rosebuds chamomile and of course lavender buds at the bottom so these are things that you sprinkle on top of the soaps so all that stuff can go back in that bag that's my sample colours and what have you here we have a big chunk a kilogram in fact of shea butter this again enhances like the uh, the quality of the soap and how it reacts to your skin and how luxurious it is in the end basically just another oil that you're adding to the soap uh, because it was cheaper to buy it from these guys and I know a lot of people don't like using this stuff uh, but I can't get it in the shops so I got some palm oil so palm oil is really good for making soap believe it or not most soaps have palm oil in this should be coconut I think there we go coconut oil two and a half kilograms I've been buying the supermarket stuff that comes in jars for cooking it's a lot more expensive doing it that way so I thought I'd get some coconut oil from the soap kitchen and then uh, oh, the order was packed by Miranda and checked by Sarah thanks Sarah and Miranda so in here we've got some essential oils this is lemon I'll not unwrap it now this is cherry berry fragrance this is mango fragrance and this is titanium dioxide so this is what you put in to make your soaps whiter so you mix this as a colorant and add that to the soap so instead of your soap having let's say like a slightly orange tinge you want it to be white or creamy should I say you want it to be white titanium dioxide is the way to go and then I think finally we're down to the last few fragrance oils we've got coconut fragrance we've got a hoba oil or jehovah we've got pure vitamin C or vitamin E that's to speed up the setting process and then we've got cucumber and melon fragrance because I like to I want to make some more cucumber uh, soaps I made one at home but the smell is just a little bit lacking when you add cucumber to the soap anyway I know that's not what a lot of you have come here for but uh, there we go we are going to be making some soaps on the channel in the future but maybe maybe not quite today so with that stuff set to one side what I'm going to do now is uh, go around the brewery have a bit of a tidy up and then I've got a little piece of uh, timber over here to cut for Froggy. He wants me to put rebate in the back for him. And, you know, it's the least I can do, considering all the goodies that he brings me. So we'll work on this piece of oak at some point as well today. And then, uh, well, then maybe we'll go and take some readings out of the beers that we did last week and dry hop them. So as we discussed earlier on, um, I think it's time that we dry hop the beers. They did go in on the 31st of July, 1st of August, 2nd of August, and we're up to the 8th now. So I'm gonna crack open the cold room, which is sitting at nine degrees. Uh, we'll turn the fan off so it doesn't blow all the cold out. And we're gonna go in there and uh, pick what hops we need off the shelves, which should be in alphabetical order, thanks to Gemma last week or earlier on in the week so I'll just reposition the camera so you guys can see exactly what we've got going on in here right and oh we're in can you check it out so let's get that there that's a better shot isn't it and uh, we'll go in and pick exactly what hops we need for this dry hop so uh, Amarillo, there's the Amarillo, is there an open bag? Yes there is, so we'll take the Amarillo out. We're gonna get uh, Citra, so ABC, Centennial, Challenger, Chinook, 
and there is an open bag of Citra. Next one is Columbus Cascade Centennial Challenger uh, la, 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 la. Columbus open bag of Columbus. When I say open, they're not open. They've been open, then vac packed and sealed again, but uh, you can tell because it's had a corner chopped off, so I don't want to open a brand new bag. Uh, let's have a look. Amarillo. Oh, I've got too many hops out. That's for the bloody boil. I, for the fermenter, I just want Amarillo, Mosaic and Simcoe. So we'll put the Citra and Columbus back. We want Amarillo, Simcoe, there's Mosaic, I don't think that's going to be enough, and then Simcoe, here we go, Simcoe, so I need the Mosaic for the vacant as well, I reckon I'll have to crack into a new bag. Right, so light off, door back on, fan back on, and we're locked. That's spot on. So I'm not going to bore you all to death with the process of weighing out every single hop. So we'll just do the Simcoe, show you exactly what I do. So normally I just nip a corner off the bag like that. I want to keep the hole as small as possible because we're going to have to put this in the vac seal you see so you don't want to open the whole bag across the full width. Um, oh god I can smell it, it smells really good. Then I'm going to tear the scales and make sure that they're on the right units which is grams for me and then we want 1.2 or 1.19 kilos of beautiful Simcoe and there's one point eighty-four, ninety-four, ninety-seven, twelve hundred grams of Simcoe in that jug. Look at those little beauties. If you had smelly vision right now, folks, you'd be going bonkers. And then what I like to do is bring in the vacuum sealer. There she is, look. So this is a new type DZ280 slash 2SE vacuum sealer. And uh, it seems to be serving me quite well. I've had it a number of years now. I bought this, I think, before we had Idle Valley Brewery up and running. So what we like to do is, you've got to pop out this little tong here. So this will seal any bag. It doesn't have to be the uh, bags with the perforations on and then we stick it across making sure we're going to get good contact with the heating element at the back edge and you've got to lock it down and turn the vacuum on and then that will start to back the bag down now you'll see it start to pull in that's what we're looking for, get rid of all that oxygen get it all out There we go. The bag starts to stiffen up once you start to get a vacuum. You can hear the tone changes as well. And then we've got the heating element set to 9 seconds because it's quite a thick mylar bag. And then you press these two, well this bar down at the front, and the tongue zips back up because it's spring loaded, meaning that the uh, element can press all the way along this foam edge here and push it into contact with the element here meaning that we get a seal across the edge of the bag and there we go that's sealed and ready to go back in to the cold room so I'm going to do the same thing now with the rest of these hops and then I'm going to go to the top of the tank and put them in and this is generally how we get that one point 
kilograms of hops into the tank and only split it between two jugs and then just squeeze the jug a little bit give her a wiggle and run her in through the blow off hole I don't really like to take the lids off the tanks unless absolutely necessary because it's quite a dusty environment and we get a lot of dust and whatnot hanging in the air so I like to keep all the tanks and vessels kind of sealed up if you will to prevent any nasties getting in there I suppose if you got a fly or something wandering during this it wouldn't get very far because of the CO2 in the tank I don't think it last two minutes but the trouble is of course what it's carrying on its back any bacteria or anything like that you don't want to be introducing into the environment so as soon as we've got those in uh, the lid goes back on I don't remember if you remember, recall a couple of vlogs ago I was talking to you about how this works as a blow off valve but it kind of it won't come out look because it's locked in by the two cams on the side but if there's any air or gas or CO2 that needs to come out it just kind of burps up past that and it's acting as an airlock in one respect there's no other way in of course if the tank is under a vacuum that can cause a problem there's enough of a gap for air to be drawn in if we're chewing if we're cooling the tank over a couple of days but if I'm drawing beer out to fill casks up then we have to come up here and do that otherwise we get an airlock so you still get air creeping in now past the sides but it remains a tight enough gap to prevent any flies or anything getting in there it works a treat for me anyway we've been fermenting with these tanks now for coming up a year isn't it I think and we've not had any problems yet okay so I built this little jig to uh, take the router around this piece of wood for Froggy so all I have to do now is get the vacuum kind of hooked in make sure all the drawers are closed so we don't end up sucking or blowing all the dust into all the open drawers and uh, put some protection on and give this old gal a bit of a round to row. Those are no good for glasses, so we'll take them off. Change everything out for some eye protection and some ear protection. We'll put the vac on and we'll give it a whirl. See if this will actually cut the mustard. I don't think that's going to do much, but we'll give it a go. Well, I kind of think that that's what he's looking for. I did send him a video asking if this was the right way to go about it. And he gave me a thumbs up. So, there we go. You can see we've got a rebate all the way round to the front here. And we're pretty much on his line that he marked out for me as well. Very, very close. So now all we have to do is hog out all that in the centre and take it down to 16 mil. That's gonna be fun, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> Maybe I'll do all the 16 mil around the edge and then we'll just come back and work from one direction and just hog all the center out because we're gonna need to have some support for the base plate while we take all the middle bit out. Cutting nicely though, say it's oak, cutting very nicely. 
Well, we're nearly there. We've just got that little section to go. This little bit here just to cut out. It's oak though, and well, it's hard on the hands. It's hard on the router bit, and it's hard on the floor for mess. Look at the mess, man. Oh my God. Anyway, that's taken me about 35 minutes just to eat away at that section there. I've got vibration white finger, but another 10 minutes and we should get rid of that. It's actually not a bad face. There's a few little scuff marks in there, but I think if Frog is just gonna stick it onto an existing mantelpiece, that's what this rebate's for, then surely just a little bit of sticks like shit or uh, you know silicon adhesive or something will just take up any slop in there, give it a nice solid base. But yeah, I'll show you, give you a little buzz how bad it is. Watch this. Let's turn the back back on. Well that's that folks, it's chopped out so we've got the rebate on the edge of the piece of timber as requested and that is ready to go onto the fireplace I'd imagine. Of course that's the good side, what you're going to see in the room no doubt. Yeah there we go, that's that done. Anyway, let me just turn this off and turn the light off and I'll explain to you what's happening next. So now I'm going to go home and get a shower and get changed because uh, A, I'm meeting Craig and Ollie and Al for a quick pint but that's not the reason I'm going out, they're just in the pub now. I've got a friend called Pete Jarvis, actually lives in Canada and he's come across brought me some of these fantastic looking beers from the Grizzly Poor Brewing Company in Alberta and uh, well it should be back in Retford tonight at about half past six seven o'clock so I'm gonna go and spend a little bit of time with Pete and catch up and uh, then hopefully we'll come and pick up the vlog look at me picking my ear on camera <laughs> so dust in it it went in that side and come out that side so yeah anyway I'm gonna go in there once I've been home to get changed and meet up with Pete and uh, and talk beer for the evening and we'll catch up with you guys on tomorrow's vlog. So cheers for tuning in, we'll see you tomorrow.